So today, lovely teachers, we're joined by Paul Myatt. Paul and I have known each other a long time. He's a passionate piano teacher, author, composer, and workshop presenter. He co-founded the 30-year-old, woohoo, 30, four-day music school network with over 8,000 UK, USA, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand students. Through four-day and piano teaching success, Paul helps teachers engage and motivate their students by coaching them to use a whole body learning approach teaching success guides and backing tracks so that they can accelerate their teaching success and earn more. One surprising fact about Paul is that he coaches swimming and running for a charity that has raised over 25 million for cancer research. We'd love to hear your thoughts about community and collaboration. Please add them in the comments or come find us on Instagram. We're at Colorful Keys. Welcome, Paul. So let's go back to the beginning of Forte. How did that start? And was it always you and Gillian? Or did it start with one of you? Or how did that get going? Well, I bought a music school in 1989. It was a Yamaha music school. Gillian already owned a Yamaha music school. There was five of us to start with. And I, I was the new kid on the block and was trying to get them all to work together. We did work together for a while until... Yamaha came along and said, you have to buy all organs. We're going, no, we want to teach piano. We don't want to teach electronic organ (laughs) because that's what what everyone wants to learn. And it just sort of ended up that Gillian and I, sort of the other other three, basically, it wasn't what they wanted to do. And Gillian and I kept working together and she was very much interested in, so brilliant with marketing and promotion and, and also keeping records like of statistics about students and running amazing concerts and things like that. I was sort of more interested in the whole education and and teaching. So we started working together and that was how it started. And I mean, Gillian has a licentiate in uh, LTCL in piano, but in teaching. And I came from the high school, training as a high school music teacher. Wow. So it was a collaboration with two maybe slightly different skill sets from the beginning and different sides of the business you wanted to focus on maybe, or you had that inkling. You had a little bit of a taste of what it was like to be on your own. I mean, through Yamaha, but running your own thing as part of a partnership. So how did that feel different? What were the benefits? Were there any cons? Oh, look, there's always pros and cons. You know, we have to work together and You have to also have the same goals, I think. And we've always, I think that's been our success, we've always had the same goals and the same drive. That's also critical. You know, Gillian's parents were businesses. My father was a bank manager. My mother was a school teacher. And I think we sort of really understood the value of hard work. We were both prepared to put the work in and we saw the successes. You know, I remember back in we bought a music school in sydney in 1995 it was offered to us to take it on and we decided okay we'll do this and you know it was a you know i had to fly to sydney every week and to do this and we had staff and all that sort of stuff and we nearly went broke <laughs> you know, we, at one stage we gillian's husband and me and her we all flew to sydney to paint the place because it had never been it'd never been badged as Forte. And we thought, and I had said, why don't we just let, no, we'll just close it down. No one will ever know. <laughs> and we both woke up the next day and went, no, we've never failed at anything. We're not going to start now. So that's when we went down and painted it and put all the signs up and, and stuff. And, and that was, you know, it was a turning point for us. It was, it costs a lot of money to fly somewhere every week <laughs> to, to, you know, and look after the staff and things like that. And, but I loved doing that and loved supporting people. And we had, you know, brilliant staff working with us. And it was just, it was, it was an exciting time to start out. Yeah, we kept going and then more people started. And yeah, it was really fantastic. Yeah, so was the Sydney one your second sort of school? Uh, well, we had, Gillian had a school, I had a school, and then um, we had the one in, in Sydney. Oh, okay, so that was your and first one had, together? Yes, yeah. Wow. Yeah, so we had separate schools. We, did, we didn't have our, we had, each had our own school. Mm-hmm. And both of our schools had about 800 students in them. So we had 
you know, fairly big music schools with and probably 30 or 40 staff in both of them. So we needed, when we were creating Forte, we realized that we needed to help, be able to help our teachers to become ready to teach fairly quickly. Because, you know, if you lose a teacher, as you know, with your own studio, you need the new teacher to be workplace competent pretty quickly. So we learned a lot about training people. And that's where I suppose my background from Clark and in being in a, a, a high school, trained as a high school teacher, sort of really helped in being able to work with people and train them. Yeah, that's amazing. So it's since expanded a lot more. When it comes to <laughs> thinking about competition and maybe how you communicate competition to the other, are they franchisees that the other schools some schools are franchisees or are they under yeah we have two we have two levels we have four day schools which are franchises they're not really franchises they're they're more of a license okay. so and they're now licensed teachers so they're they're both at different levels in our organization the four day schools are in commercial premises they have to be in commercial premises and they have to have the signage and yeah. all that sort of stuff whereas the accredited teachers can be running them in their home or like I think you probably know Vanessa in Perth, she drives an hour and a half some days to teach Forte in a school because schools have reached out to her mm -hmm. to say, can can you come and teach group piano here all day? You can charge the parents. The parents have the choice whether they want to do it. Most of them do it because they know the benefits of learning music. So that's a completely different situation. Yeah. So when you're thinking about it for your own schools or when you're talking about it with your licensed schools or anyone else how do you think about competition for music schools do you talk about it in terms of marketing against other teachers in the area or what is their actual competition is that part of the conversation at all i'm not sure whether it is i don't ever see other music schools as being our competitor what i do see is our competitor is dance soccer <laughs> T-ball, <laughs> frisbee, oh my gosh, beach frisbee that we have in <laughs> Australia. It's like, you're doing what? <laughs> athletics, little athletics. I think they're our competition. I never see other music teachers as being our competitor. I think piano teachers are a bit like hairdressers. You know, everyone likes their hairdresser and they never want to change their piano. Like, like piano teachers, they love their piano teacher. They don't want to change their piano teacher if they're happy. And also, because we have an early childhood program, we start children from six months to three and a half. We can grow our own students, which, and it's amazing when they come through having done that early childhood program. Those kids, they're so musical. I have one now who's 16 and she's sung with the Australian Opera three times at the Opera House and she's at the, at the Conservatorium High School in Sydney and amazing musician and just her understanding is unbelievable yeah incredible she's, i'm so lucky she still comes to class <laughs> she goes, oh you teach me all the naughty stuff <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i agree with you i just wanted to see especially from your perspective running bigger schools obviously i run as much small in terms of my actual school it's much smaller it's just a couple of teachers working for me and it's more of a mentorship program but that's how i think about our competition too i mean i don't feel like I'm competing with any music schools nearby. They're doing quite a different thing. First of all, we have a different style. You're similar in that what you do, others really aren't doing the same thing around you. But mm -hmm. I agree, our competition is basketball and other kinds of activities. Even more than that, it's staring at your phone. I mean, that's a real competition for a student's time the phone or the ipad or the xbox or whatever it is especially as they get slightly Absolutely. older so you know that's that's what the research says as well you know mccrindle the mccrindle research on generation alpha which are all the kids that have been born since 2010 really goes into depth about some of their issues and a lot of teachers especially school teachers are really finding and, and piano teachers as well finding that engaging the student is such a challenge and really we need to be changing the pedagogy to be able to deal with that to you know even in in lessons you know they're they're not engaged and you really need to get them engaged and i know we we had such a wonderful time in january when we did the whole body learning course and but that sort of 
interactive learning environment where you're moving and singing and playing percussion instruments or doing fun activities that really engage the student, that's when you got them. Yeah, I agree. And it's going more and more that way. I was watching a video just like, I can't remember whether it was on, I think it was just on Instagram. It was a college professor and he was interviewing different students in his class, asking them, so at their, they're at the university level now, asking them when they got their first phone and whether they mm -hmm. think now that that was too early or they felt <laughs> like it was late. And it was so interesting yeah. hearing their responses. I was surprised actually how old they were, like several of them said 14 or 15. And I was like, oh, mm. <laughs> you wouldn't get away with that. I don't think parents would get away with that in Ireland anyway. And I'd say that <laughs> even shows the difference that that many years can make and maybe the difference in, mm -hmm. I don't know which university it was, but, you know, depending on the economic status and the background of the parents and all. But mm -hmm. a lot of the comments mm -hmm. were saying, what? My niece is three and she has a phone, you know? So it's getting oh, younger and younger <laughs> where we have to compete with all of these different things. And they're also being trained to not pay attention or pay attention in a completely different way than we might have been used to. Well, I, well, kids actually don't have any problem with attention. Um, the attention, you, you know, you see those kids and, and how they're just looking at their phone. They don't have any problem with attention. They have a, they have, um, you just need to be able to get their attention. And that's just, the, that's where the issue is. So I know you, you are coming to Australia in July for the Australasian Piano Pedagogy Conference. And we're both presenting, I'm actually presenting a paper about the evolution of piano teaching and I'm specifically talking about that issue and I've got all the research there as well as some of the strategies of how to deal with that and that's actually I can give everyone a really great suggestion for a book to read this is a book called How We Learn by cognitive neuroscientist French cognitive neuroscience Stanislas Dehan it is should be on everybody's reading list if you teach people you need to read that because it is the latest. It's 2020 edition, so it came out in 2020. So it's pretty recent research about what is happening inside our heads. So, and he's done all the research. His specific interest is for reading, but it relates to all education. It's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've been diving into it since you recommended it on our Teaching Beginners <laughs> course, which was oh, fantastic. <laughs> That's where I heard the name, because uh, I love hear, love reading about neuroscience, especially science of learning and a lot of books on that topic. I'll just gobble up, I love it. So, Paul, we were chatting at MTNA about how wonderful our little community, our bubble of the teaching world is, because there may be occasional cattiness, but it is not anywhere at the level of what I see in other industries where mm -hmm. competitors, which we could be considered competitors, are sniping each other and, you know, trying to talk each other down or use underhand mm -hmm. tactics, silly things going on. Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful mm -hmm. that that doesn't happen so much in our industry and that we get to work together and collaborate. And we, as you mm -hmm. mentioned, work together on your beginners course back in January. How did you decide when you were putting that together? Because you've run it with a few different collaborators. How did you decide on that sort of model or that approach of bringing in a different person each time? Oh, well, I certainly don't have the, the only way of teaching. And whole body learning is an approach to teaching. It's not a method. Yeah. So you take the approach. And the approach is based on Orff, Delcroze and Kadai. And they're all approaches as well. So I want to collaborate with other people because, oh my gosh, I learned so much as well. <laughs> so that's one of the greatest things. And I've collaborated with yourself and Leah Lavis and Sharon Mark Taggart from Curious and Samantha Coates from Rote Repertoire. And I've got a few people on my list as well <laughs> so that I'm hoping to collaborate with in the future. And I've done the same thing with the whole body learning courses that I've run for like ABRSM exams or Trinity College exams and AMEB exams or RCM exams. So that having 
an expert in that. So often I've had a, an expert in the actual curriculum. In September, I'm actually working with Penelope Roskell from Trinity Laban Conservatoire. And she's going to be talking about the technique required. And then I'm going to be talking about whole body learning strategies. So I'm really excited to be working with uh, Penelope because she's one such an accomplished teacher and pianist but also she has basically the bible on how to play the piano she does <laughs> with that, yes that big thick book it's bigger than the bible pianist. in fact but yes it is comprehensive <laughs> but i love how practical she makes her explanations too i mean she's mm. it's not all this advanced level that technique that you got often get, get in books like that it goes from the beginning and you can look up mm. anything i love having it as a reference so that's fantastic that she's going to be collaborating too Yes, I'm really excited by that. Yeah. So I hope teachers will take a few ideas. Not that you you might not be running a course for other teachers or anything like that, like me and Paul are doing. But maybe it is that you're looking to open a music school and you consider having a partner rather than going it alone. Or maybe it's something smaller. Maybe it's a composition project and you get together with a local teacher to do that. Or I did a silent film festival where I invited local teachers to send their students to that as well so maybe you just open things up a little bit more especially Mm -hmm. to local teachers i hope they'll be inspired to go ahead and do that absolutely there's some great ideas like composition together and and also bringing your students together collaborating doing ensemble playing and things like that the composition stuff is just fantastic i'm really lucky because i work with gillian we compose together as well and then I have a friend here in, in Sydney, Susan Head, who we often do work together. And, you know, having somebody to work with, it's just so fantastic. And it can really, you know, build some business for both of you. Yeah, absolutely. And it helps you think in different ways that you, they might ask a question that it wouldn't occur to you to ask, but that changes your whole perspective on something or just makes a little tweak changes how you approach something so speaking of coming together paul we're both running events in a couple of weeks as this episode goes out luckily i don't feel like they're in competition with each other they're almost (laughs) at the same time but they're about a thousand miles apart so (laughs) they're both in the us but they're about a thousand miles apart and yours of course is focused more on the group side of things so would you like to tell our listeners a little bit more about your group conference Yes, it's called Group Piano Live, and I am just so honoured to have been asked to be part of this with Deborah Perez, who from Pedagogy in Motion, and she has a way cool kids keyboard keyboarding course. Of course, the wonderful Leela Viss, which I'm that excited about to work with her for three days. It's really interesting because you could say Deborah and I both have competing products because... You know, we both have group piano materials. And so what we're doing is we're doing a single stream conference and for three days and teachers will get to experience both Deborah and myself teaching because we're going to have two rooms and one's going to be set up how Deborah sets up her room and then my room will be set up how I set up my room. So two completely different experiences from teachers and we we sort of say we almost feel like we were separated at birth Deborah and I (laughs) because we have exactly the same sort of feelings about group piano and how empowering it is one for the students but also for the teachers so that's happening in Corpus Christi from the 18th to the 20th of July it's a wonderful vacation place it's on the Gulf of Mexico so and the actual university where Texas A&M University in Corpus Christi it's on its own little island and so the I can't wait for drinks after the, after the conference each night to see the sunset over this beautiful beach Oh, wow. That sounds dreamy. So I hope teachers... So where are you? Oh, we're we're in Cincinnati, Ohio. So it's not exactly a thousand miles, but it's roughly. I looked it up. (laughs) So pretty far away. Definitely not on a beach. But yeah, (laughs) should be fantastic. So where, again, can teachers check that out? Group? Uh, They can go to pedagogyinmotion.com and just click on the link that says group piano live and that's uh deborah's website perfect 
Okay, thank you so much, Paul, for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure, as always. Thank you so much, and I'll see you in Melbourne. Absolutely. <laughs>